right. We did it. Um, oh, Megan, I totally forgot to give you your uh, to explain what's about to happen. But now we're live. So we're going to do this live, everybody. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, just to let you know, we hang out for the first five minutes or so, and then we start the show. So we are live. So just remember, if you have any conspiracy theory secrets to reveal, uh, everyone's listening. Um, but yeah, we'll talk for five minutes and then and then we'll go into the show and it'll it'll sound like I've started a show at about the five minute mark. It'll it'll make a lot of sense. Okay, and then great. I will uh, introduce my co-hosts and then I will introduce uh, you as the guest and then we'll chat for about 15 ish minutes, maybe 20 minutes because we're down. We're down a Dave tonight and then I will thank you for your time and you're free to close this rendezvous window down and enjoy the rest of your evening okay or if i'm having so much fun i can stick around is that right that's your call i okay. never like offer that but if but if you do want to talk about the topics that we're going to discuss today or have other topics that i may randomly bring up uh since again we're down a dave tonight um then then by all means feel free we can we can definitely free form it so yeah it's your call if you want to stick around that gives you a chance to doubly shamelessly self promote anything that you're working on both at the end of the <laughs> interview and also at the end of the, of the whole show. So yeah, there you go. Canadian space advocate is saying time to admit there's life on Venus. So. <laughs> I don't give my secrets away just yet. <laughs> stick around to the end of the show to find out. Whoa. Yeah. There you go. You gotta stick around. Spoiler alert. No life on Venus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right and then of course uh, behind the scenes we've got pamela engineering this um but hopefully we're gonna have a a less uh we're gonna have the low maintenance engineering version of it so so get used to this layout for the whole hour i think is going to is going to work out pretty well um and of course if you've got questions like i said we're down a dave so if you've got some questions uh, for the panel, by all means, uh, let us know. Hey, Dave's not feeling well, so and so he wasn't able to join us, which is too bad because he had some really cool stories. But hopefully uh, we can bring up Dave's stories for him because they're kind of in my head as well. All right. OK, um, OK. Um... I'm not sure if it's me, but it looks like the video is freezing from my side. It's, but the audio is fine. Yeah, it looks. Okay. Y'all are On frozen. the YouTube or on the. The rendezvous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're we're, we're, ah. we're we're talking to Pamela. It, like, people have to get <laughs> oh, used to this. Like, hey, this is this is brand yeah. new that that we've got uh, Pamela as our engineer tonight. But you can't hear. I think we should make it so that the audience can hear the engineer. I can't think of any reason why we shouldn't. Sometimes what do you think? It's more fun to have the ghost. Uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, tonight. it looks really weird to have us having a one-sided conversation with ourselves like a crazy person so anyway just consider that pamela i i think i just added my audio yes i did everyone can now hear me now but Perfect. i i may choose not to let them hear me if i need to tell you things of course i have that power yeah i can tell yeah. only you if i want to that's the tricky part yeah is that you're gonna have to now remember to turn off and on your audio depending on how this works but i yeah. but i do think having the disembodied voice of the engineer showing up every now and then maybe even sucked into the show itself is a is a is a cool idea yeah the nice like thing about disembodied is like i am not camera ready and <laughs> this is okay when you always have a good voice for audio i do so you I do. yeah no preparation I'm, necessary i was gonna say pamela it's not like i'm camera ready either so <laughs> yeah all right uh i think hopefully people Maybe people, oh, there you go. People are, can confirm that they can hear the disembodied voice. So I think that's I think that's great. All right, let's get started. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, October 20th. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about 
water rules on Europa. William Shatner flies to space. Lucy launches exoplanets discovered by their auroras, Mars conjunction, and more information on perseverance. Joining me this week now with now there's like no surprise. And so you can just see everyone is here. So we've got Nicholas Castle. Hey, Nicholas. Hi. How's it going? Welcome back to the Weekly Space Hangout, but now a regular co-host. Thank you kindly. Right on. Uh, and uh, Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Hey, Carolyn. Hey there. Hey, how are you doing? Very well. Uh, people have been hearing the trials and tribulations over on the on the Monday show, uh, but that I'm living in a trailer. It may look like I'm out in space in front of Planet Nine, but I'm actually huddled in the back of my trailer in front of a green screen. Uh, <laughs> desperately hoping that my new studio will get built so yeah no this tr this trailer life is uh is it's not great I'm not loving and i it. wondered how it was going for you oh yeah no it's, <clears throat> i mean it's, it's beautiful i love being here on the property in the in the nature there's bears and deer and lots of cool birds and bugs and and the fall leaves are happening but at the same time it's a pretty cramped space and yeah yeah i'm not I'm not enjoying mm. the the trailer part the hardware the technology and that's like what it would be like flying to space i i'm out as an astronaut i think at this point like i'm already chafing being in a in a trailer imagine being inside to a crew <laughs> dragon that would that just be the worst forget it that's stupid all right uh now before we get into our special guest who could it be how will, how will we know who our special guest is? Um, I just want to give a huge thank you to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are our friends, our fans, and mostly our executive producers. They're our bosses. They call the shots. We just show up and do whatever it is they tell us to do. And if you want that kind of complete and total power over me and other science journalists, all you have to do is join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Totally free. Go to wshcrew.space. They will hook you up, give you your executive producer credentials immediately, and you can then go out and bring on really cool special guests. Whoever you want. Invite William Shatner. I'll interview him as long as you invite him and he says yes. All right. So speaking of special guests, we've got Megan Russell. Megan, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thank you. Thanks so much. This is a really cool opportunity. Well, it's, we, we'll find out. You, we'll decide by the end of the show. Okay. You're gonna stick around for the whole episode. You're gonna have to give us like a, a rating at the end. <laughs> All right. The the question I always ask is is who are you and what do you do? Okay, so um, I'm just hearing a bit of audio in the background. Yeah, Pamela. I can hear Pamela. So I wonder now. Pamela's talking to people in her room, and I wonder if she's left the audio going. And we're already learning the terrible dark side of having the disembodied voice. Oh, maybe. So can anyone hear Pamela or is it just us? No, I can hear. No, 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 just us. Oh, the hmm. audience is the question talking about food anyway. All right. Uh, so Megan, oh, who are you? What do you do? Okay. So currently I'm at the planetary science Institute in Lakewood, Colorado. Um, I have a few titles here, but my title with PSI is research associate. Um, I'm a science team member and an operations team member on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter Shallow Radar Instruments. Um, awesome. And I'm a system analyst for CoSharps, which is the Colorado uh, Sharad processing system. So those two are related. And I also have a few other hats on a few other projects that we can talk about as well if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so so let's let's start with uh, I mean, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, just because that's one of my favorite spacecraft. In fact, there was a great image that came out recently of Perseverance uh, on on the surface of Mars captured by by MRO. Um, oh, I love those images. All yeah, of them. All yeah. of them. Yes. Yeah. All of them are, are absolutely incredible. What's it like working with a I guess the most powerful telescope? off that's not in earth orbit um it's it's pretty cool um and i mean the mars reconnaissance orbiter isn't just a it's a telescope yes but it also um collects different types of data um it collects radar data so that we can see underneath the surface it looks at um spectral signatures of things on the ground and uh yeah it's 
I got to say, it's pretty cool. It's been a really fun path to get here. And I, I just, yeah, I'm loving it so far. I know that I kind of wanted to help out with space mission operations. And this was like a really uh, great way to start that. Now, now it is that giant telescope that is able to resolve objects on the surface of Mars down to, and I forget the number, like 0.6 meters or something just ridiculous. Um, but, but you work on with a different instrument. So can you explain what the shallow radar experiment does? Yeah. Yeah. The one that you just mentioned is high rise and that returns those spectacular, beautiful, visible images of the surface at the half a meter resolution. Um, but I'm working with the shallow radar instrument or Sharad. Um, and that's, that's a really cool radar that's orbiting right now. So it's collecting data from space. And what it can do is um, we can image underneath the surface. So we can see different layering that's going on underneath the surface and um, to try to try to assess out um, what the, the subsurface might be made of. And specifically this um, instrument works really great um, in icy regions. Mm. So looking at, for example, the Mars polar ice caps. So how far down, like if you were to, to shine the shroud on some part of Mars, I'm assuming you can look down through the layers from what we see on the surface down into it. How, how far down can you, can you peer into Mars? Um, well, it's a, it kind of depends on what we're exactly looking at. Um, but it is, um, it, it's, it's the shallow version of the radar imaging instrument. So um, it's seeing the uh, first couple hundreds of meters, and um, whereas there's another instrument called Sharad, or sorry, Marsis, and that's looking a little bit, a um, little bit deeper. Um, Nick, you got a question there? Oh man, you're going to make me actually talk during your interview. Yes. I was just wondering if you've ever seen any evidence for things like lava tubes uh, using any of the radar instruments. Um, yeah, so. I, I kind of just switched over from Venus to Mars recently, but I do know that there are people that use that instrument to look for things like lava tubes. So it looks, it's really good in the icy regions and looking at um, maybe layered ice and the polar and mid latitudes, but um, people also use it to look at um, different volcanic structures, um, just like maybe buried lava tubes. Um, so it's seeing more or less the first one kilometer um, into the surface um it just depending on where it's looking and it has a resolution of about 15 meters so it kind of have to do a trade-off between um uh what you know what size of lava tube you'd be looking for so probably slightly larger uh features like oh, that that's really cool uh, i mean there was there was a, a fairly recent announcement i guess in the last year or so from the european space agency about the discovery of liquid lakes underneath the surface of mars and I know that it's a little controversial at this point. Have have are you, is your team able to confirm or deny the existence of of liquid water under the surface? Yeah, so that was that was really cool. That was a few years ago, and I remember I was at um, UBC in Vancouver, and uh, that paper came out, and they were seeing they call them uh, bright basal reflectors. So something underneath the surface of the ice, probably maybe close to the actual surface of like where the rocks start. Um, they were seeing like really, really bright regions. And so mm -hmm. when the radar can see through the ice and it can see the layering in the ice, and then it was returning a very bright signal um, in sort of more concentrated areas on the surface. And um, radar is really great because, you know, it can image this, but it also takes a little bit of interpretation of the data. Um, so that was one interpretation of it initially. Um, and then a few papers have come out, um, most notably recently by um, researchers that uh, that sort of use the data, called them Friends of Sherrod. Um, and I think they're using the Marsis data, um, looking at maybe there's a different explanation for that. Maybe it's not liquid water, yeah. um, because it would require maybe the water being sort of warmed up by subsurface heat flow. And they were thinking that maybe that, you know, there would be too much would be required for that. Maybe the water was salty, so it was lowering the um, the freezing point. But um, a new uh, a new paper just came out, and they were thinking that maybe it's a type of clay. So it's an actual just a um, small concentration of material that just happens to be really bright to the radar, and not necessarily liquid water. What would it take to confirm it either way? Well, you can send me, and I can you know sure. take a drill. <laughs> 
<laughs> they could drill to Mars. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well, I mean, um, so, yeah, so I mean, you, I mean, you're joking, but but seriously, I mean, if you send you and Bruce Willis with yeah. a drill team to Mars, um, is that yeah. the only way to know whether or not it's water or it's clay? Well, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to um, uh, come in the way of my chances of going to Mars with Bruce Willis, SpaceX, but um, uh, another way, I mean, so that's a really interesting question because there's, there are different avenues that we can look at. And um, I, I think it would just be about looking at all the different possibilities and maybe seeing what the, the um, most probable one would be. And you know maybe sending some images that are and some radars that are higher resolution, or maybe just going back and looking at the data and processing it slightly differently in light of these new observations. Right. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't really think of like a smoking gun that would you know really um, prove prove or disprove that. It's I mean it's kind of interesting. I mean you had the the discovery, and now this is probably ten years ago, where you had these gullies that were formed in the springtime coming off of the sides of the craters on Mars. And it was thought that there was some kind of liquid rolling down the slope. But now that's been, I don't know if debunked, but lots of legitimate other explanations have, have come to light on what could be causing it. And then, as you said, oh, there's lakes. Oh, no, wait, it could be clay. And even like the amount of water and the length of time there's water on Mars is coming under a lot more, I guess, speculation. On the one hand, it's great that we have all these instruments on Mars. Uh, to be able to have these kinds of conversations but on the other hand it's it feels almost like our hopes and dreams are, are driving the the science where do you yeah, stand and I, I, I like well i like how you put that because what you know what we're seeing is literally science unfolding before our eyes you know um we have a cool observation we come up with a hypothesis we test that we iterate on that maybe a different team comes in with different expertise and uh, different interpretation of the data. Maybe another team comes in and you know has a different perspective. Um, and so, and I, I feel like a lot of people have asked me like, how many times have we discovered water on Mars, or how many times have we discovered uh, this or that? And um, it's it's really about just I guess just remembering that science is an iterative process, and we can um, keep sort of exploring and keep finding these cool things and. Um, in terms of those, um, the gullies that you mentioned, the um, I think, I think you mentioned or talked about the RSLs, the recurring slope linear. Yeah. Um, yeah. At first, we thought that those that might be like melt water that was coming down, and um, and other people came in with um, some really cool experiments in um, uh, actually like sand dunes and looking at um, how sand uh, actually falls down slopes and what that would look like from space. So um, I don't stand either way but i just i want to keep i want people to keep coming out with the cool science and you know maybe we can eventually go there one day and have boots on the ground and con confirm that i mean even like i think within the last couple of weeks there was some analysis from i think it was perseverance seeing boulders that had been moved around by glaciers inside jezero crater and so Ooh, you've yeah. got this this situation that clearly ice moved stuff around at some point in the ancient past but then that could also maybe explain what looked like water features in fact it could just be glacier glaciers moving around so so yeah and i'm actually on a project called the um, subsurface water ice mapper and i'm a co-investigator um and that is looking at the sort of inventory of sub of sort of subsurface water ice on mars um as the name implies and uh, one of the papers I was just reading for it, um, they actually uh, were looking at these um, scarps, so these really uh, steep um, cliffs on Mars, and um, it looks like that those are actually exposing subsurface water ice. And we can see the layers, and you mentioned um, boulders moving around. Well, in one of the observations over a few days, they actually saw um, sort of these boulders coming off the side of this um, icy cliff and just wow. falling. And, yeah, so we're actually we are seeing that type of mass movement happening today, and it's really exciting. Even now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Carolyn looks like she has a question. No, okay, all right. Um, see, I'm trying to I'm trying to get you guys in, get get you in here. Um, but so, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, we're quite excited about 
the potential for water and its connection to life everywhere we find life on life on earth wherever everywhere we find water we find life and hopefully yeah. across the solar system it'll be the same it'll be the same story is do you think the prospects for mars are getting better or are they getting worse um so the prospects for finding liquid water on mars yeah and, and just like the conditions for life in now or in the uh -huh. past like yeah it, um it felt like it was our was... only hope and now europa and enceladus are all like look at me look at me and so you know oh, the yeah. eyes are off mars yeah i mean you gotta love, love the icy moons but um i think mars i think we're just I think we're just getting a better picture of what's happening. And I, you know, I, I, I never, I'm someone who just likes the pure science, you know, I never, I never was like pro water on Mars. Um, what I think we're seeing more of these days is actually the water trapped as water ice and actually um, shallow, like not super deep between the, beneath the surface. Um, so, I, and I think that's exciting because that can actually be used today for, um, so if we send humans that can be used for resource utilization um, that can help us to um, sort of pin down um, atmospheric models that we have of Mars um, going back into the past so that we can say something of definitive about the past climate of Mars, for example, and how it responded to the different orbital changes that it went through. Um, so I think although we're not really converging on answer of liquid water on Mars, I think that we're getting a better picture of what's going on and seeing that the answer is probably held up in the water ice right now. So that's like the next big thing, I think. Carolyn. Well, yeah, well, I'm listening to you, Megan. I'm just wondering what, aside from actually going to Mars, would be your dream mission, the next dream mission to maybe either pin down more about whether there was water, there is water, what happened to it? Um, well, my my dream, I mean, I'm working on a mission right now and like I love Mars, but I got my start in Venus and Venus just had three uh, missions um, announced for it over the summer. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say that's my those are my dream missions. But um, for Mars, uh, the, the next one that it's going to go is the um, International Ice Mapper. Um, yeah, International Mars Ice Mapper. Um, so that one's going to be pretty cool too. And I think that's like, that's going to uh, answer a lot of questions and give us a lot more cool data to work through. I mean, we're definitely discovering that there's more and more water in surprising places in the inner solar system. Water mixed into the regolith on the moon, water and other volatiles on a lot of the asteroids like Bennu and Ryugu. Water Do you and think and that? And yeah, 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 possibly the, the, yeah, the, in the regular thumb mercury. And, and so, you know, the, I guess the original thought was that the solar radiation would just dry the entire inner solar system, dry as a bone. Based on this, do you think that we're going to find more water mixed in with the regolith across Mars? Maybe even something that is usable for future explorers. Um, yeah, definitely. And I, 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 we're seeing that actually nowadays um, in terms of the uh, shallow ice that we're detecting. And we're seeing them not only in the polar caps, but um, actually the mid latitude. So closer to a little bit closer to the equator than we were expecting um, as sort of shallow layered deposits. Um, we're seeing them on these ice exposing scarps. Um, you know, there's these vast regional ice sheets that are buried under a mantle of material that's kind of protecting that ice. Um, and we're seeing it not only as ice that's mixed in with the regolith, as you mentioned, but also um, ice that's uh, it's excess ice. So it's like actually pretty close to being pure. Um, and I think I think that's that's probably the next big thing that we're going to be able to um, to investigate because you know we're going to be able to probably target specific areas now and um, with better instruments and see like because we can see it now we can say some more about it and maybe even go there someday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk briefly about then about Venus. So are you working on any of the of the missions that are going to be heading to Venus and then in the next round? I, I would love to. Um, not currently, though. I think that there are still sort of early days. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, I would love to. I worked, I worked with the Magellan data and that was um, that orbited in the 1990s. And a couple decades later, I, I am able to still take that data and pull um, pull from it and um, 
do cool science with it still. But um, yeah, very excited for the it new is, data sets we're going to have. It is kind of sad, though. Like, I remember I was in high school, not even in my final year of high school, when the Magellan data came out. And it's oh. incredible. And the image, and we still use those images. It's kind of stunning that we don't yeah. have better resolution images of the surface of Venus than what came from, from Magellan. And so what big scientific question would you love to see answered about Venus? Well, we're seeing all these little hints that Venus is volcanically active today. And, but there's nothing really definitive. So I, I would love to see like, just, I would love to see that smoking gun. Um, so my research sort of centered on a, a volcano, a small volcano called Nerina, Nerina Tholis, and it was sitting on the edge of a bigger feature that is also volcanically, uh, um, was volcanically created. And so I would love those missions to maybe target areas like that to, to tell us, like, this is a volcanic feature, yes, but how old is it? Is it geologically recent or is it really old? Um, and I would love to see maybe like an active lava flow, or I would love to detect a Venus quake using the, um, the INSAR that's going to be orbiting around Venus. Yeah. And I would love to, yeah, just maybe see some like lightning in the atmosphere or um, just, you know, something, something light up to really like get us excited. Yeah. Isn't age dating on Venus really difficult to do because of the thick atmosphere? It just lowers the cratering rate? Exactly, yeah. So Venus was uh, really interesting when Magellan first arrived because they only found, I think, uh, less than a thousand craters. And for the compared to the other planets in the solar system, they were expecting to see more. But yeah, you're right. It was um, probably, um, I mean, the atmosphere has something to do with it. It's, a, it's an atmosphere that's um, super thick. It's about 90 times thicker than our own atmosphere. But also, um, we think that Venus has some sort of way of uh, resurfacing itself. And that was interest, that's an interesting um, notion because we don't see any sort of signature of plate tectonics like we see on the Earth. There's no big subduction zones. There's, uh, there's no big spreading ridges where new crust is being created. Um, so Venus must have a different resurfacing mechanism, but um, we don't exactly know what that is. Um, so yeah, the surface is very young, but we don't know why. It's kind of unnerving to think of of a planet being capable of just turning itself inside out, just oh all yeah at once. Just um yeah, and that was that was one of the theories that it just like burped one day and it just you know the surface just overturned in a very geologically short time. Um, yeah. I think now it's probably a bit more less catastrophic and more sort of it's just ongoing and it, through time. But yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of unnerving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense with with Venus having. Like if it doesn't have plate tectonics, then at some point the pressure builds and the lava has to get out somewhere, and then it's just explosive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And 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 once again, I think like there's so many unanswered questions about Venus. A, a year ago, we were talking about the fact that that Venus probably had oceans as recent as probably just a couple of hundred million years ago. Could have you could have oceans today if conditions were a little different. And then <laughs> now we're hearing that nope. Venus never had oceans, not a chance. Where well, do you stand on um, that? Uh, there, there were a few modeling papers um, from uh, Michael Way, I believe, um, where they uh, modeled, they did some modeling uh, based on current conditions and going back in time. And um, uh, Venus, maybe, maybe not an ocean, but Venus might have been covered in uh, like shallow lakes or had some sort of like, you know, water system. And basically the conditions on Venus would have been um, clement enough to allow water to exist in the state that we see it on the earth. And uh, so I think, I would like to think that maybe as recently as a billion years ago, Venus could have had water based on that modeling. Yeah. We don't really, we don't see any evidence for it today, although there are some papers that have come out recently um, saying that, the, you know, we might, that these features on the surface might be made from water, but um, it's not really definitive also. So what is the next piece of research that people should be watching you to, to keep track of? The next the piece next... of research that yeah. people will be watching me? Yeah. Um, yeah. What should we be well, stay, stay tuned for? Uh, just, uh, I mean, keep, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, but um, also, 
we're going to be uh, working on this uh, subsurface water ice uh, mapper or ex sort of extending it. So there's going to be um, hopefully um, some more data coming out to um, to help out with this global map of the water ice inventory on Mars, um, specifically looking at sort of the morphology, of the surface. Um, I hope to write another Venus paper soon. I just put out one in the summer on this uh, volcano. Um, so yeah, I hope to be writing another paper soon and you know, you can keep an eye out for that. And if people want to follow you on Twitter, where should they go? Oh, let me, uh, let me just double check my Twitter handle because um, I changed it recently to be, you know, a little bit more professional. Um, so if you, yeah, so it's mega 78 or M E G U H 78. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. you're going to stick around because we are going to be talking about stuff that's in your wheelhouse. So consider yourself a regular cool. panelist from this point on. And I will randomly ask for your input on, uh, on various stories as we move forward. But thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about your work. Super fascinating. And uh, I'll, you know, let us know when you find water and or life on Mars, please. Yeah, definitely. Or Venus, you know. <laughs> or Venus. Yeah. Yeah. Either one will be fine. All right, let's move on to the rest of the stories this week. So Nick, what do you got for us? Well, I had a couple of stories. One was uh, Mars just came out of conjunction. Let's talk about that. Now, this may not sound like very much to, um, well, the general public, but for all of us that do mission control work with Mars, it's a lovely, lovely time where we get a two week vacation, by which we mean that's when we actually write our papers. So about every two years, Mars is on the far side of the sun from the earth. Whenever Mars is within about two degrees of the sun, as visible from the Earth, we can't reliably send a radio signal to it. I mean, it's easiest to think about you can't send a radio signal straight through the sun because, well, you know, big plasma ball doesn't let us do that well. But if it's really close, um, all the emissions the sun puts out tends to scramble what signals we do send through. So there's about a two week period where it takes for Mars to go from two degrees on one side to two degrees on the other side so that we can see it again. And during that period, we put all of the spacecraft around Mars in what amounts to an idle mode. They usually are still doing some science, collecting some data, but they're just sitting there filling up memory banks and not reporting it to the Earth because they can't. Um, that means us mission controllers get a break to do other things. Um, like I said, like write papers. Um, actually, for a lot of us, it was really convenient because our team meeting was, um, well, right now. Um, so we got a chance to prepare our talks and get ready for what science discussions we would have. And actually, just last week was the final deadline for you know, a special paper that we're um, uh, releasing as a team, uh, talking through a lot of different discoveries that MSL has made over the past couple of years. Uh, so um, conjunction's a fun time for us but it means the whole fleet stands down. I mean, right now we've got two rovers, a helicopter, a lander, uh, three orbiters, if I remember right. Megan, am I right on that? Yes, I think so. MRO, Maven, Odyssey. Maven and Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah. Is it bad that I lose track? I'm <laughs> There's a lot. There's but a Mars lot Express of space right? Mars yeah. Express, he says. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I then, of course, the non-NASA stuff. And then mom. And then also the Chinese. Yeah. Yes. And the and the United Arab Emirates spacecraft. Yeah, the Hope, Hope yep. mission. Yeah. So it's a it's a crowded it's a crowded place there right now. Um, and we so all have like... to stand down when we're during conjunction oh. because it's a physical property. It's nothing nat national dependent. Um, oh, I think Pamela. So Pamela, if you're listening, um. Actually, uh, Megan's going to stick around for the whole episode, so you actually don't oh, have to shorten that was it actually to the three. Carolyn, that dropped off for a minute. Oh, okay, all right, I see. Oh, never mind. Pamela's way mm -hmm. ahead of me. Then please continue. Um, uh, like, is it like you know when you like fly on an airplane and finally you're not connected to the internet, and for the first time you get to finally catch up on all your email? Is it like that? Or is it Some... like you're just terrified about your babies on Mars and what kind of mischief they're getting up to? Is it bad that the answer is sort of yes and? Um, I mean, on one hand, it's the 
nothing should go wrong. They, they should be fine sitting there for two weeks. Just like, so I have an infant daughter. You know, when we set her down to sleep and we walk into the other room, she'll be fine, right? Right? Maybe. What can only... Who knows? On the other hand, it can also be a really, really nice rest, you know, when little one goes down for a nap and you get a few minutes to do something else. You get to go to bed at a normal time for two straight weeks. And then you're back to Mars Mars days, slowly shifting one hour Actually, it's funny later you should mention every that. day. We try really hard to keep the schedule human friendly when we're doing mission ops. I mean, yeah. Right at first, whenever a new lander gets to the surface, we'll do a pretty continuous uh, cycle where for, I forget if it's one, two, or three months, uh, but they bring all the mission operators to JPL uh, to get everyone trained up and they're working continuously. That's not a sustainable mode because it overruns your entire life when that happens. Uh, I haven't been part of one of those. To anyone designing a Mars mission, please include me so I can be part of one of those because it sounds really cool. But for a, uh, for a normal couple of operations, days, you we wanna... try to keep the hours that we're talking with JPL um, and building stuff for the rover between that kind of, you know, eight to five. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a little dependent on when our window is to talk to Mars. Some days that just happen so early that we have to swing the whole schedule a little bit early. Some days it happens so late that we have to swing the schedule a little bit late. Um, but really, because you're building a plan that's more than one day at a time most of the time, uh, there's enough overlap that you can do that um, you know, fudging of the schedule to keep it to a nice, friendly set of hours. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the really interesting parts is dealing with how people are distributed on the Earth. Because we've got teams in France, we've got teams in the UK, we've got teams in Hawaii. How do you put all of them on the same time schedule? Yeah. And and I know that, in fact, the um, NASA's communications deep space network is kind of overloaded. And so losing all of that Mars communication probably lets them catch up with a bunch of other spacecraft as well. It's a good time to talk to everybody else. Probably. Yeah. Um. I wonder, so when you get to a point where there's like a relay station, I wonder if like it's going to be a good thing or it's going to feel like a bad thing. Like now you never lose communication. Now you can never stop watching obsessively your spacecraft on Mars. Well, as a species, we've gone through this a number of times uh, in recent history where communication has gotten easier and easier and easier. And each one of those steps, uh, there's more continuous communication. So the question's not, if the technology changes to enable this, will that be intrinsically a good thing or a bad thing? It's how are we going to deal with it? How do we make yeah. sure that that's more good than bad? Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then now it's happened. We're, we're through the other side of it. And now we just have to wait another two years for it to happen again. Yep. Pretty much. Perfect. All right, In Carolyn, meantime, what do you got for us? Perseverance team. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Sorry. Just in the meantime, the Perseverance team has released their first major science paper uh, mm. talking about an exciting result from the uh, Jezero crater. Well, okay, um, why, don't, why don't you do that before we switch over to Carolyn? Yeah, why What'd not they find? talk about Mars all the time? Sorry, Carolyn. So, uh, it's okay, I don't mind. Sent... Excellent. One of the reasons why we sent the rover to Jezero crater was to look at these uh, features of rivers that had existed long in Mars's past. Now, we've seen evidence of rivers, uh, and in this crater, we'd seen evidence of what looked like a delta. The problem is, is it's really hard to be absolutely certain it's a delta from orbit, because you're only really seeing the top-down view. What you really want to see are the layers of sedentary rock underneath that that make it up and tell you a lot about you know, the climate that happened, what happened to the lake level, was it steady, did it change? Are you talking floods, are you talking uh, just a steady seasonal stream. Like, what's going on? Give us more details. Well, this first science paper looks at several uh, escarpments. These are steep cliff faces uh, within the delta features in the crater and shows that sedimentary progression. Also really exciting, up on top of it, there's a bunch of boulders. And these don't look like something that's happened from weathering. They look like something that happened in the original rocks that form the delta, which means... The lake level changed a lot, and there were major floods that happened with this. 
because you need a lot of force mm -hmm. of water to move a boulder downstream, especially if it's going, they estimate, between four and 10 kilometers. Hmm. So that's a lot of flow. Yeah. This is adding just a ton of detail to our understanding of the geologic history, which tells us a lot more about the environment and whether or not this could have been a habitable location. Does, uh, I mean, Perseverance has collected its first sample. Is it going to be able to get a sample from some of these rocks? I hope so. Um, oftentimes it just depends upon what you can drive up to. I mean, yeah. we like to think about sampling mm -hmm. horizontally, but it doesn't really happen very easily. I mean, a lot of the stuff we build is built to go directly straight down. So the question is, can you get right on top of something nice and flat and stable and still get that? So and an, an so. area that you know is going to be super interesting, whereas, you know, when you yes. see it, yeah, that you see too. it obliquely. Yeah. Yeah, well, fortunately, we've got Ingenuity, so it can scout around and and try and get a good angle yeah. to figure out a good, uh, you know, angle of approach for Perseverance to go and take a crack at some of these rocks. I mean, it would be interesting, though, because I think you would, you might be able to find information about the source, where the rock came from, and then compare yep. and contrast it to where the rock is now and get a sense of, of what conditions it, you mm -hmm. know, what caused it to shift over to this new location. Yep. Yeah, that'd be great. I Now I'm going to cut you off and we're going to move to Carolyn or we'll run out of time. Carolyn, what, what have you got for us? Oh, oh it's okay. I just want to say one thing. Every time I look at some of those sedimentary rocks, I'm just itching to get that hammer and go out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, with a bucket, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think I'll transition with Europa here, and then maybe we'll get to William Shatner towards the end, because that's yeah. kind of what I want to end with. But so last week, there was a, a, a report out. It was a, a, a basically a um, paper from Hubble Space Telescope about Europa. And Europa, as we all know, is this, you know, little moon of, of uh, Jupiter. It's one of the four Galileans. We know it's it, the smallest of them. It's got an icy crust. It's got a very thin oxygen atmosphere that's sort of been detected, salty ocean, and in the middle of it, there's this rocky core. And so whenever I've talked to you, you know, to the public about Europa, and it's been a year and a half since I haven't done that many talks in public, um, I'll get at least one person reminding me that also Europa is the place in the movie 2010 Odyssey 2 that we were warned to stay away from. All these worlds are yours except Europa, attempt no landing there. So there's this kind of mystique about, about Europa that, you know, it, it is physically this very interesting place, but this people in the movie told us not to go there. Yeah. So to planetary scientists, Europa is this, you know, is some place that they want to continue to study. So we've got the Europa Clipper that is, I, I don't really quite know what the, where it is in its design, but it's supposed to launch if everything goes well in 2024, and then it will get to, to the Jupiter area. And um, by 2030, I think it will start mm -hmm. going into into yeah. orbit. So they want to have, you know, we want to look at Europa. It's this interesting place. And there is this idea that it might possibly be this habitable world in some way, if you, you know, for large enough values of habitability, you know, if you, if it's got water warmth and something for this worth, this life to eat. Well, if you look at Europa, you see that it is this frozen world It's very smooth. Um, it's hard to tell that there's an ocean under there, but it, but I think that surface really belies the existence of that ocean along with the, you know, other studies that they've done with it. So the big question really was for quite a while, and I think still is what's resurfacing Europa. And I, you know, I was thinking about that when Megan was talking because here's this little world that is just, you know, slicker than a billiard ball basically, and it's resurfacing itself. Now plumes have been discovered and, but those are largely centered in, you know, towards the Southern pole. Um, we know that there's some sort of tidal heating going on in the center of Europa. The newest thing is, you know, this water ice, this, this, you know, ice particles has been, have been forced out of Europa by the, probably by the tidal flexing. There's water that gets stuck in pockets up in the surface and somehow it gets forced out in these plumes. But the interesting story to me, you know, this, this is sort of like one step after another, after another, as we're trying to discover what's really happening inside of Europa, um, was this discovery that, Hubble did, and this was made over a period of about 15 years with spectral data, that that there is this atmosphere, sort of a half atmosphere over the trailing edge of Europa made of water vapor. Yeah. So the big question is, 
where is it coming from? How is it being made? Um, what's yeah. causing it to form? And this is really a need more data kind of situation. So what are the what are the proposed mechanisms for having this water in the atmosphere around Europa? Well, I think the plumes are kind of a kind of a smoking gun, but I don't know that everybody's willing to point to that yet. And there is this sublimation that happens off the surface of, of Europa, which could also be contributing to it. But why is it only concentrated in the trailing hemisphere? That's a big question. Yeah. And that's yeah. something that I think probably Europa Clipper could help answer. It's going to fly through the plumes, take samples just like Cassini did at, at Enceladus. Oh, yeah. yeah I definitely. mean, the moon has an atmosphere. <clears throat> Mercury has an atmosphere. Very tenuous, yeah. but they exist. And in yeah. some cases, it's just interaction with the with the cosmic environment, cosmic rays slamming into it. Uh, oh, especially for Mercury. Yeah. Yeah. yeah micrometeorites, mm -hmm. uh, material coming from the sun that's getting captured in the mm -hmm. magnetic mm -hmm. field, et cetera. So so there could be a lot of mechanisms. But yeah, absolutely. Right. The one that is water escaping filled with bacterial life that is floating around. Absolutely. Europa, yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Megan, uh, Place your bets. What's causing my, this? Uh, I was about to ask. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's alien. <laughs> no. Oh, I yeah. don't know. I mean, so uh, Europa, I mean, the uh, environment around Jupiter is so interesting, right? I mean, it could be that the, the you know, the same thing that causes the tidal heating, the, the squeezing and the mm -hmm. um, pulling of the, of actually Europa from the gravitational pull of Jupiter could be, you know, doing something where there are like small cracks. And again, it's, it's, uh, it's leaking uh, copying out. Enceladus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I wondered about is that, you know, radiation environment. Yeah. That's also interesting. That I mean, yeah. The largest yeah. object in the solar system is Jupiter's magnetic field. Yeah, yeah. So if you stand on the surface of Europa, you're getting about 1800 times more radiation yeah. Yeah. than you do say just no. out in space. Wow. So it's bad. It's oh, uh, yeah, I think you'd be dead within a few hours or something yeah, like that. Well, I mean, you would, yeah, if you long, stood on yeah. the surface of, of Europa, you'd have a lethal dose within a couple of days. And you'd be and dead. I've always yeah. wanted to go. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, yeah. this just did. Yeah. I think it'd be so cool. And now we can't do 2010, right? But but I just thought, it, yeah. you know, it's just, as I said, it's like one step after another after another, building up this story about Europa and using yeah. water vapor and water to tell it. Yeah, attempt no landing there because it's just like it's dangerous. Because you'll die. Crazy. Yeah, yes. you'll die. <laughs> so don't do it. Um, yeah. yeah. I want to go to yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, crazy. that's just it. That's just it. I've thought about that too. So that's sort of the, the main story that I talked about this yeah. week. And and I'm still digging into it because I, I, I think there's a lot of speculation, but it still does center around the plumes and this sort of squeezing action and the sublimation off the surface. So it could be a combination of all three. And I don't know that they got a measurement of how thick that half atmosphere is. I I didn't find any data about that yet. Yeah, I didn't I didn't read that. But I mean, hopefully, yeah. as you say, Europa Clipper and the Juice mission, and maybe even some further observations from Juno will help get a. Put yeah, I wondered about that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, now that Juno's through most of its main mission, they're willing to take a few bigger risks with it and send it into the radiation zone. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. best picture I could find was was really pr still pretty distant from from Europa. Yeah, I mean, uh, same thing. We've got Magellan in 1988 taking pictures of Venus. We've got Galileo in 1991, 93 taking images of I'm trying to think when they were taking images of uh or maybe it was late 90s. Anyway, oh, 95, 95 yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. So you've got like a long time since we've had some really nice yeah. images with modern technology. Mm -hmm. Cassini has would have blown it out of the water. Of course, yeah, so yeah. The first ones we have are Voyager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, in fact, a lot of the times when we show a picture of Europe, we're still showing pictures from the Voyagers in eighty one. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so, I mean, well, I think the Galileo yeah. one's a little better. I had one, you know, that, yeah. that that I used in the story. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait for the Europa Clipper images to to come through. So let's talk about uh, William Shatner. Yeah. So you know, I, I was watching that and. I, I will, you know, we will all concede up front that, you know, William Shatner is a very accomplished actor. He knows how to control his, what he's going to deliver to an audience. And when I saw him standing there as after he'd walked out of the, 
you know, walked out of the capsule and everybody's popping champagne corks over there. He's standing there really trying to gather his wits and, and he's got the chops to act any way he wanted. And he, he absolutely was overwhelmed by this experience. And I'm, I'm focused on that because there's a lot of other conversation you can have about, you know, Bezos and all this kind of stuff. But, but there he was basically acting at that. I felt like I would act the same way when I was, if I'm, if I ever got a chance to fly, I'd be getting off and standing there and going, saying all kinds of things to myself and yeah. trying to process yeah. what had just happened yeah. to me in, in the space of 10 minutes. And so that's what I wanted to bring up as a point of discussion is I think he really showed us the way forward. Yes, he's Captain Kirk. He's beckoning us to come out to space, but he's also this 90 year old guy who went out there and had an experience that was not what he expected. No matter what he prepared for, it was bigger than he expected. Yeah, I love and that, that was really what I saw moving across his face. Yeah, it was it was quite frustrating because he was starting to talk about clearly, as you say, this moving experience. And then Jeff yeah. Bezos runs over and sprays him with champagne as he's trying to express <laughs> the party on dudes atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He's trying to yeah. express this ineffable awe at our oneness with the universe. He's mm -hmm. experiencing this overview effect and he's wiping a face full of champagne. Uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was really it's like having to, yeah, just having to like give a presentation and uh, to focus on that. And then someone comes up behind you and like, yeah. it just seemed like he was trying to just like, really just process through the whole experience and he was doing it in real time. And then yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, read the room. I mean, I've, I've met him. I've met him a few times and I've seen him on stage and he's, he's consummate. I mean, he knows how to work an, an audience. He knows how to work a stage, um, get him in front of the camera. He's great. But this was just beyond any of that type of experience. Yeah, people and I'm me, surprised he didn't go like this, you know. But, yeah. but he didn't. People just want to know, like, would I go to the moon? Would I go to Mars? Do I want to go to orbit? And I'm like, nah, not really. But I would take the Blue Origins flight, I think, because yeah, you're you're up and you're back in an hour, and you've had the chance to see the Earth from from that high altitude. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. Else. I just I I want to experience that. Like, yeah. Definitely. Well, yeah. I was ready to plop my hundred thousand dollars down, but you know, I'm hoping maybe by the time I get to be his age, if I haven't gone, it'll be down to maybe five thousand or maybe yeah. the cost of a first class ticket or something. But, but you know, he showed that it was possible. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. every person who goes to space comes back, just oh yeah, just with this understanding that there's this thin little line that connects us and the and space itself and that there are no borders, no divisions really that, that we've just made them all up. And, and it shows that we're sort of stuck here on this planet. We got to work together and, and make it better and not, and stop wrecking it. Yeah. Now, uh, Dave was going short. to, uh, was going to bring up a couple of stories and I, I'll just uh, pitch in for him. One is the Lucy mission has mm -hmm. launched. So over the weekend, NASA's Lucy mission, which is off to visit eight asteroids in the main asteroid belt and two of Jupiter's Trojan regions, is off and away. Uh, there's a problem, which is that one of its solar panels failed to latch as they were extending them. And so now we get to look at a couple of, I guess, months of NASA engineers coming up with heroic solutions to figure out how to make that thing latch. There's going to be a lot of like spacecraft turning quickly and then hopefully turning back the other way and the and the, the <laughs> latch will come on yeah. but it's it's too bad because it's going to limit the kinds of turns and 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 reorientations it's going to be able to make as it's <clears throat> going past some of its targets so it's it i did read that it's actually i did read that it's actually generating about the same amount of electricity as the latched one F right for now but but if, yeah yeah if, if it has to turn quickly to image the Good surface point. of one yeah. of these asteroids as it's going by mm -hmm. then it could drift into an unlatch and and right now there's plenty of power but it's it has the the i guess it's going to be the farthest away any spacecraft has ever been using solar power and so Ooh. it needs every watt oh, that it yeah. can get yeah and this yeah. Not only, you know juno demonstrated because you got like 125th the energy density when you're out at the orbit of, Ju of Jupiter and it's going even farther out into the Trojan, some of the Trojan regions, it's, this is rough. So hopefully they'll be able to sort this. I'm sure they will. And I'm sure 
we'll mm -hmm. hear every last little part of it. And now the other story that Dave was going to talk about was that astronomers have have using LOFAR, the low oh, yeah. frequency uh, I forget array the, array low yeah. frequency array yeah, yeah. Um, which is a which is a radar uh, a radio instrument have detected and this is amazing they've detected radio waves coming from the region around red dwarf uh red a bunch of red dwarfs and the theory is that they're detecting the radio emissions coming from the magnetospheres as they interact with wow. the flares coming off of the off of the star as we know red dwarf stars have have quite active flares and and when, say, they interact with the Earth's magnetosphere and they cause auroras, they also give off these these very telltale radio emissions. And so it's a it's a mind bending idea that astronomers are discovering exoplanets that are protected by magnetospheres through this process. And it could be a shortcut to find, say, Earth sized worlds orbiting other stars through the radio emissions of their magnetosphere. So it's sort of like a twofer. You're learning that there's a planet there and also that the planet is protected by a magnetosphere, which then could theoretically make it more habitable for life. And LOFAR is sort of a, a prototype, prototype idea, but the, the full version of this could be um, both the square kilometer array, which is going to be built by the end of the 2020s, as well as a uh, potential radio telescope built on the far side of the moon. And we could very well enter this era where astronomers are detecting worlds out there protected by magnetospheres, which is really one of the key requirements we think for life. So it's a it's an amazing development and uh, very cool. All right. Uh, well, you know what? We've pretty much reached the end of our hour. Uh, so now we move into the shameless self-promotion phase of the show. Uh, let's see. So, Megan, you're a special guest. Once again, uh, what are you working on and where can people find out more? All right. Well, um, I'm going to try to keep my Twitter more updated because uh, I think it's a great way to and also my LinkedIn. Um, right now, I'm just working on a uh, keeping the Sherrod instruments um, busy and uh, picking targets on the surface and also this uh, water ice mapping on Mars. Fantastic. All right, Nick, what are you working I'm on? Working where on can people find out more? Proposal? Sorry, what was that? Oh, I was asking what you're working on and, and where people can find out more. So I'm working on a PRISM2 proposal for a um, robotic lander on the moon. Uh, I can't tell you much more about that because reasons. Um, but I'm also continuing to work with Mission Ops on Mars. And my wife and I are trying to do a social media outreach uh, campaign where we're uh, going to drive to a whole bunch of different national parks with our uh, very small child and talk geology and ecology and every other science we can find wherever we go. Oh, that sounds amazing. Uh, more about that in the future, though. Fantastic. And if people want to follow you? Um, there's planetary geodoc is the easiest place right now that's your twitter yep okay awesome carolyn well i am sort of in between projects but i did just have a conversation yesterday with two scientists about writing a book about their topic and i can't talk about it so but it'll be another science book because that'll be my eighth one so stay tuned on that Anybody you can else find have me something they can't talk about yeah, really. It's sorry. Like all of life is redacted. Yeah, I know. We're all under NDAs. It, I'll just say it's about the solar system. How's that? And um, uh, you can find me online at uh, thespacewriter.com, and my Twitter handle is thespacewriter. And that's really about it. I survived the pandemic and survived the summer away from you guys, and I'm back. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, donate my shameless self-promotion to the Hangout-a-thon, which is, of course, CosmoQuest's weekend-long, 36-hour, insane but fun uh, hangout over coming up this weekend, where you'll be able to hang out with various scientists, astronomers, musicians, players of games, and uh, be educated and entertained and possibly encouraged to donate to help us keep all of the educational activity that we do 
and keep it going for another year. So you can go to cosmoquest.org slash X slash hangoutathon and find out more information. You'll be able to see the schedule and also how you can donate. And of course, you'll probably see me and many of the people who, you, who you're familiar with will make an appearance over the course of this, these 36 hours as we sing for our supper and try to help get uh, your donations to help keep all of the uh, activities that we do going throughout the year. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap things up then. We've reached the end of our hour. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Thanks to all my co-hosts, special guest slash co-host, as well as my other co-hosts. Good to have you. Uh, thanks to everyone watching us both on YouTube and on Twitch, as well as all the moderators. And a special thanks, as always, to Nancy Graziano for keeping us all organized. We could not do this without you. All right. We'll see all of you next week or on the weekend at the Hangout-a-thon. Thanks All everybody. right. Thanks so much. Good to see everyone. Bye. And then...